morning. It is good to see you this morning. Why don't you, uh, I see somebody that uh, I haven't seen in a while, and I want to go tell them hello. Why don't you stand and join me? You see somebody that you haven't seen in a while, or you'd just like to say hello to? Why don't you do that? Why don't you go tell somebody hi that you hadn't seen in a while? Okay, here we go. The challenge will be to rein this group in, I understand. Let's continue talking about the power of the cross. George Barna writes in his book, Growing True Disciples, and this is a quote. My study of discipleship in America has been eye-opening. Almost every church in our country has some type of discipleship program or at least a set of activities, but stunningly very few churches have made disciples. In one of the nationwide surveys that they did, they asked people to describe their goals in life. Almost 90% of the adults described themselves as Christians. Four out of ten said that they were personally committed to Jesus Christ and believed that they would go to heaven when they died. But not one of the adults they interviewed said, and here's what they said, not one of them said that their goal in life was to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now here's the clincher. This interview included pastors, other church leaders, and hundreds of people who regularly attend church. We know that our nation's economy, it's not in excellent shape, but we know that our nation's economy is stronger than our nation's morality. People in this country are far more interested in faith and religion than they are in following Jesus Christ. Believers are largely indistinguishable from non-believers in how they think and how they live. And as a result of that, because of our compromise and our liberalism among us as Christians, we have lost our place at the table of culture influence. And we put in your worship folder, it's several years old, but it, uh, because I don't think anything has got any better since that data was put together, but it is an indication of why that we have lost our place at the table of culture influence and showing that there is very little uh, difference between Christians and non-Christians in the way that we think and in the way that we live out our life. So if this is true, then why is it true? I believe somewhere in the explanation the word cross must be put on the table for debate and discussion listen closely somewhere on our place of discussing and talking about why it is as it is there has to be the word cross i would say that almost all american christian christianity recognizes the image of the cross but do we grasp the significance of it? We have established a crossless Christianity. A crossless Christianity where grace is cheap, sacrifice is ignored, denying self is unheard of, serving others is overlooked, and commitment is no longer called for. 
rather than preach his cross and our cross that transforms us from our individualism, we have altered our message to accommodate it. This rampant individualism, this aggressive consumerism, this ugly me mentality has caused churches to evolve into an entertaining amusement Sabbath exercise. Now I know that some of you may disagree, but as uh, in general speaking and as at large across this country, that is really true. While people make decisions to join Christian fellowships and increase church roles, we did not and we are not making disciples men and women who follow the principles of Jesus Christ by tra them transforming our lives into his image. So here's the bigger question. Now that the church in America is well on its way down the wrong road, how do we hold people steady long enough to get them to buy into being a true disciple? In other words, we are so far into amusing people in the church that the window of transformational ministry is so narrow and so brief, you wonder, will we ever find it and will we ever be able to fit it in what needs to be fit in? Because you know, for the most part, spiritual formation and Christ's transformation is not a criteria for people finding a home place to worship. Let me say that again. For the most part, spiritual formation and Christ's transformation is not a required criteria for people finding a home church. We must ask ourselves, once we see the light, will we even get a chance to make for spiritual maturity? Because the entertainment trumpet is being blown so loudly, people come and go in church so easily. And you all know this and you all understand that. I was here at the church the other day, and my wife called, and she said, Gary, we need to talk about something. And my first thought was, my Lord, she's going to leave the church too. Amen. When we appease egoism, when we pacify self-centeredness, when we accommodate entitlement and individualism, we damage the foundation of not only the church, but the entire civilization. When self-importance and the philosophy that things should happen my way, relationships will inevitably dissolve. Please know this, and you already do, you already do, but let me remind you, there is no way that things can happen your way always, and you and be, I be in a healthy relationship, regardless of who it is. Amen? You see, when personal desire and self-fulfilling ambition become the greater God, lifestyles can only become immoral. Hear that. And when me sits on the throne alone, emotional health is non-existent. Paul Waddle writes, and I quote, Individualism leads, individualism dead ends in loneliness. The point I'm making and trying to make this morning, the church's mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ, to be salt and light, to preserve the community. Yet the way we do church, we are making self-centered religious demons that are damaging both the church and the community. Alvin Toffler coins the phrase, and here it is, modular relationships, which that phrase that he coined evolved into a phrase that he coined throwaway relationships and so you have that you have his uh, uh, phrase of modular relationships and then you have the th phrase throwaway gener a throwaway generation and then we come up with this term throwaway relationships you see this rampant individualism is no doubt providing the momentum throwaway relationships are running off of you see, when things in a relationship infringes upon the meism mentality, we unplug and we throw it away. We plug in when self is being served, but yet we unplug from friends and family and spouses when it insists with little regard to the consequences. In other words, in other words, we plug in when it's convenient, and when it isn't, we unplug. Throw away relationships. Come on, gang. And what feeds that is individualism, is this self-centeredness. And guess what? We get our self-centeredness and our individualism edified in most of our churches. 
Hello. Amen. Thank you. You see, this is the reason that the true gospel of Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. Now watch this. Let me say it. This is the reason the true gospel of Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. It delivers us from bondage. It forgives sin. It removes guilt and condemnation. It assures us that we will avoid hell and we will go to heaven when life is over. But, hang on. It meets head on the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Meets head on rampant individualism with a self-crucifying cross. It declares that no, with no apology, self must die in order for self to live. It mandates the way to live life is giving up your life. It insists that you're not your own. You were bought with a price and there goes entitlement. Look at this passage, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 16, 24, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Gary Kinneman writes, the cross, listen, the cross isn't just something, or I'm sorry, the cross isn't just about what God gets us out of, an exit from sin, guilt, shame, and hell. The cross is about what God gets us into. Now hear very closely. Listen to what he says. The cross is not just something that God gets us out of. But the cross is something that God gets us into. And in John chapter 10, Jesus says that he has come to give us life and to give it more abundantly. In other words, the cross, by what it gets us out of, it gets us into. And the Greek word for abundantly there just simply means extreme. Jesus has come to give every one of us an extreme life. Extraordinary, remarkable life. But notice how we get there. Again, a life that is not encountered among men unless Christ provides it. A life that is remarkable. Jesus provided through his cross a remarkable life. Now listen, don't miss this. Jesus provided through his cross a remarkable life. We experience it by carrying our cross. Associating a symbol of death appears to be an oxymoron for living life. Listen, listen again to what Jesus says. I'll read it. If anyone desires to come after me, he let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whosoever loses his life will find it. Follow this. This is the same Jesus who said, if you want to find life, you must lose yours. He's the one who said, if you want to be exalted, you must humble yourself. It was the same Jesus who said, if you want to gain more, then give it away. It is a God thing. Watch this now. It's a God thing. It's a new way to live. It's a spiritual principle. It's kingdom economy. And the fact of the matter is, many of us as 21st century followers of Christ know very little about. We, 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 we know the image of the cross. We know the image. We know what it stands for. We know the image of the cross. But I'm telling you, we have lost the significance of it. And therein lies why our lives are so, so similar to people who are not following Jesus Christ. I know it's backward thinking. But it really does work because it's the way in which God intended for life for a disciple of Jesus to be lived and that he blesses. You see, this is living life contrary to what we've always thought about happiness and peace. When we're called upon to carry our cross, everything within us screams in protest. But in our initial screams, we're unable to hear that in our self-death, Jesus manifests the fullness of his life through us and that is an extreme life. Now, look, get this. When we pick up our cross, when we deny ourselves and we pick up our cross, because we by faith embrace his cross, the fullness that Jesus provided in his cross becomes ours. 
as we pick up our cross. Again, backward thinking, but that's the kingdom economy. That's the way God put together spiritual life. It was really intended to be totally and radically different than how the world looked at life. And so what has happened to us? And let's be honest, what has happened to us in 21st century America and in, in, the church, in the Christian church in America today, what has happened to us is we're living life as our culture lives its life. And we are very empty and miserable. Amen? And powerless and, 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 and we're so frustrated with life. And, and many times we come across lines like this. We do. We say, if this is what it is living for God, man, I, I'm just not up for it. I'm just not, this is not where I'm at. This is not what it is. So how do I find it? You find it in a cross that you carry. When you are carrying your cross, and when I'm carrying my cross, God comes running. Watch this. Each time that you and I die to ourself, Christ is there to resurrect his life in our self-denial and through the death of ourself. Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Oddly enough, hang on, oddly enough, carrying our cross is essentially partnering with Jesus Christ in him bearing our burden. Watch Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, carry your cross. Take my yoke upon you. Me on you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Him dying on his cross and you and I responding by carrying our cross gives us a connection. You see, when we acknowledge his cross, we bow in worship. And when he sees us carrying our cross, he runs with provision. Paul knew the way to experience God's power and provision for living was connected not only to Jesus dying on a cross, but as well Paul carrying his cross. Philippians 3.10. Listen, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. You see, when we get serious about Christianity to the point that we deny ourselves for Jesus' sake, God gets very serious about bringing his kingdom to our earth. And it's through that mechanism and means that it comes about. It's the cross connection. We are yoked together. You see, when believers walk out their faith and carry and his cross by carrying our cross, we are more than conquerors. We are more than overcomers. The connection gives us the fullness of provision that comes from Jesus. I don't know. I, I'm thinking a way to try to illustrate this. And... Uh, and uh, one of the things that came to my mind was, it's interesting, if, uh, if, you, own a, um, if you own a Harley Davidson, you, you immediately have a connection with other Harley Davidson owners, amen? It's kind of interesting, kind of interesting, you're driving down, I, I don't know this, I don't know this, uh, I've got some friends that uh, have motorcycles, uh, Harleys, and my brother have a Harley, and, and uh you know, we've had conversation, and you're, and you're driving down the road, and you've never seen this person before, and you meet them, and and uh, and and you, you know, you you make some uh, some gesture of uh, how you doing, and uh, and uh, there there is a there is some sense of connection. It, it's interesting how that 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 connection can be, uh, as far as a particular kind of car maybe that you own, huh? Or uh, maybe maybe a particular kind of truck that you own. Uh, or, and it can take it out of the automobile context. Here's the point that I'm trying to make. When we carry our cross, there is an immediate connection with heaven's resources. Only can it happen. Only can it happen. Now, watch something here. And I, and I think this is, this is extremely important. You see, when believers walk out their faith, in his cross, by carrying ours, there is an immediate connection. Think about what Paul writes in the Philippian letter. And he said, 
We have the mind of Christ. Remember that one? That this mind may be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now let me show you something here and I don't think you want to miss this. How does that happen and when does that happen? I want to tell you. Okay, maybe it begins the journey when you get saved. Okay, all right, I got you on that one. But listen to me very closely. The mind of Christ is never comprehended any more than when you and I are carrying our cross. Because it's the one he died on. Huh? I will say to you this morning, the power and the peace that we are looking for is not found in any more self-individualism. And it's not found in any more self-centeredness. The peace and, 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 the, and the strength that you and I are looking for to cope with life's adversaries and adversities is found in giving up your life. Because when you give up your life, he resurrects his life in me and you. I promise you this. Whatever it is that you cannot overcome, whatever it is that has you in bondage, I promise you, when you give up your life, carry your cross, and he resurrects his life in you, you will overcome because you have resurrection power that is living in you. You see, think about it this way. The Holy Spirit, when we got saved, and we talked about this last uh, Sunday night, but when we got saved, the Holy Spirit was in us. He indwelt us, and there's multiple scripture that confirms that. The Holy Spirit indwells us. But it is only through self-denial, crucifying the flesh, giving up your life, that the Holy Spirit is released through us. So I want to say to you, as a believer of Jesus Christ, you have enough power in you to change this world. Amen. Amen. But it cannot get out until there is a crucifixion of me. Now, if you come from a Pentecostal background, you would hear something like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you come from a Church of God background, you would hear something like entire sanctification. Or if you were to come from maybe some other backgrounds, you would hear something like maybe the Baptist background, you would hear something like full surrender or, the, uh, or uh, submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now listen very closely. Listen very closely. This is not new to our historical theology. It's just... It's just not something that we talk a lot about in 21st century Christianity. Now, now you say what you want to about those who embrace this total radical sellout to Jesus Christ. I want to tell you this. When they prayed, they had the power. And when they spoke to demons, they trembled. We speak to demons and they just greet us. And the reason is this. The reason is this. You know, you remember the story in Scripture. Paul I know and Jesus I know, but I don't have a clue who you guys are. Huh? The only way we connect and identify with Jesus is through a cross. The cross that he died on and the cross that we carry. Can I tell you this? If you're not willing, if you and I are not willing to carry our cross, then Christianity has very little benefit in our lives. Hello. It, it's really frustrating. It doesn't make sense. And I'm going to tell you something else. It don't work. Living a life after a Christ that has been crucified. Somebody told me one time. Somebody told me one time. Walk up with me and said, you know, I, got, I want to tell you something. I want to say something to you. This was many years ago. And they come up and I thought, sure, go ahead. If I know what they're going to say, I probably wouldn't say, sure, go ahead. But he said, I just want to tell you something, young man. You cannot preach a crucified Christ with an uncrucified ego. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? You can't follow a crucified Jesus and not be crucified and picking up your cross and following him. I want you to know this. It's going to be a struggle for us, and it always is. This is going to be hard for us. This is going to be a challenge for us. Uh, but I want you to know this. What you're looking for is found when you and I die to ourselves.
We give up our life to his lordship. That's what we're looking for. And that's the journey that he wants to take us on. Okay, wrapping it up. You see, there is something deep inside of every one of us that resists our cross. I don't think there's any exception to this deal. There is something deep inside every one of us that resists our cross. We're obsessed with individualism. We insist on living our life in the ghetto, in the slums of our private, self-serving, self-defined life. We insist on it. And it's killing us, but we still want it. It's killing us, killing our relationships, killing the church, killing the community. We want it. We insist on it. We, we, we are obsessed with the individualism. We insist on living our life in the ghetto, in the slums of our private, self-serving, self-defined life. All the while, the culture around us keeps piling on the illusion that living for yourself is the pathway to what you're looking for. This is a lie that comes from hell. And Satan orchestrates this lie. This illusion that living for yourself is the pathway to peace and what you want in life. And the truth of the matter is, that is not. Interesting. And we Maybe we'll talk a little bit about this the next time. I don't know. But, but, but it's interesting. It's interesting. Do you understand how consumerism thrives? I want you to just follow this thought. We talk a lot about how the church has developed into a, you know, a, into a consumeristic mindset. Do you, do you understand how consumerism thrives? Hang on now. Hang on. Watch this. Follow it. It thrives on making you unhappy. No, 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 no. No. You've got to first be convinced you're unhappy before you're going to seek something that makes you happy. And I want to just tell you something this morning. There is only one thing that gives you an eye peace and makes us happy, and that is following Jesus Christ. And that don't just mean be saved and be baptized and show up and, and worship on Sunday morning. Come on, amen. I'm telling you, and I'm, I'm wrapping it up. What we're looking for is found. Resist it, whatever, <coughs> whatever our response may want to be. But I'm t- it is found in dying to yourself. Okay. Now, watch this. In the garden, Jesus initially resisted the idea of dying on his cross. And it was for one reason. He did not relish the thought of becoming sin for the world. You see, we resist the idea of carrying our cross for one reason. We do not relish the idea of denying ourselves. I'm going to confess something to you. I'm just going to confess something to you. Take it however you want to. I hate to deny myself. Yet Jesus, after deep prayer, went to the cross because it was the Father's will. And by him going, he released redemptive power upon the world. I pray today that after deep consideration that we will embrace our cross because it is the Father's will. And when we do, we release the power of the Holy Spirit upon our life and upon our church. I invite you, I invite you to come to an uncomfortable place. I don't, you say, Pastor, you probably ain't going to have many takers. And, and, and again, that's been, that's been the... That's been the trend of the church. The way we get people to become takers is we appease to self. Huh? We make it about you. Amen? Make it about me. See, the, the way that we get people to respond is we some way or another twist it around, manipulate the gospel, and make it about you. But if you read the gospel and you look at the life of Jesus, and if we're going to follow Jesus, guess what? It's not about you or it's not about me. It's about denying yourself, picking up your cross, and following him for his sake. And I want to tell you something. You won't miss a thing. In fact, you will increase your chances of heaven's provision many times many fold again I invite you to to an uncomfortable place carrying your cross yet I promise you that you will enjoy an extreme life full of the provisions of eternity 
So this morning, as a symbol of our willingness to carry our cross, I'm going to ask you to come and partake in communion. Because it is a, it is a reminder of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to ask you this morning to come. And if you'd like to come, and, and of course, as you know, your, uh, your, your uh, bread is in the bottom of the cup. And if you'd like to come and get it and come to kneel to an altar and just simply, just simply say, Lord, I understand this morning the way to the fullness of life, the way for me to be filled with what I am currently empty is denying myself, picking up a cross, and doing your will. And so I'm going to invite you to come this morning and, and as a symbol, as a physical symbol of that your commitment that you're making to your Lord Jesus Christ, Lord I, I want to carry my cross. I don't like it. I don't like it. I'd, I'd rather do my own thing. I'd rather make marriage and I'd rather make church and I'd rather make job and I'd rather make community all about me. I really had. But God, after I do that time and time and time again, I am left so empty and I'm left believing the illusion that I need another toy, another trick, another something to fulfill me. Would you come this morning, take the cup, take the bread, a symbol of Jesus' death, and connect to his cross. Bow your heads with me. Father, you have invited us to an uncomfortable place. It's one that some of us are not real familiar with. And I'm not sure, Lord, that I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to work because we have, we have accommodated self. We have twisted and manipulated a gospel to accommodate self and to make it about me. And there's been very little about the gospel that we've preached and that we've listened to that said, no, no, die to yourself, crucify the flesh, pick up your cross, and go follow Jesus. So I'm not sure how, Lord, this is going to shake out. I'm not sure how far down the road you can go and, 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 and get back, but God, we, we, we certainly live with hope. You got my attention, Lord. And I believe you'll get the attention of this body of believers. And every trick and trick it and every deal and thrill that, that we can pull out of a hat and pull out of experience, and it still leaves us empty and void. I think God we're going to realize, oh no, oh no, I really do need a, a cross to be fulfilled. I really do need a carry. I, do, I really do need to carry a cross, Lord, to bring heaven to my side. Father, so I just pray this morning that if we're committed to that cross, that we, that we come and take communion. And Lord, if we're not committed to our cross, then, then probably our coming and taking communion would be, at best, just an empty exercise. Because there's no connection to the death of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, this is in your hands. In Jesus' name.